during the, the McCarthy era, you know, many people's lives were disrupted and many people were silenced and lived in fear. And I don't know if we're in a, a, a sort of a parallel time. It's, it's not the same in terms of labeling someone a communist, but it, it seems as if it's, there's, there's some similarities there and having to be quiet about certain things. And with the McCarthy era, how did you see the evolution of film change? story well because we were on the subject of Trump and, and I'd like to say something about the McCarthy era and how it's different from our era because I think that the difference is that during the McCarthy era everyone was afraid of McCarthy apparently the entire Congress was afraid of him until they finally turned on him but they were afraid of him and so was the entertainment business and so was uh, were the people of the country they were they were all more or less controlled by him uh, for a while. And even the media was afraid of him because he didn't want, they didn't want him to turn on them. And that's a huge difference because in today's world, the media is not afraid you know, of Trump or people who support Trump. The media is attacking him uh, as much as they are supporting him. There's different media supporting him, others attacking him. And I think that's a healthier environment even though it's, it is a crazy environment. I mean, we are becoming crazier and crazier. But if you can hang on to your mental you know, <coughs> alacrity through all of this, uh, it's a very uh, stimulating time, and it's a very uh, evolutionary time where we see where things go with this. Because you know, his attacks on the media have caused the media to say, well, we're not gonna stop doing what we're doing. Whereas when McCarthy was attacking the media, the media was being coerced into silence some of the time. And that, that has not happened. Uh, which means that the, 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 the kind of wall between government and the people through which media operates uh, has just about disappeared in the sense that no one feels that the governors, you know, the, the people in the legislature and the White House and the Supreme Court are separated from us by this wall of respect that, that they used to be separated by, uh, this unbreachable wall. The media has gotten so powerful, partly because of the internet and, and the cell phones and all of that, that that wall is almost non-existent now. And because of that, it's, it's going to cause evolution in this country and, uh, and around the world. It's already causing, causing you know, evolution. <coughs> we just can't define yet where it's going to go. Uh, so I think it's fascinating. And I'm sorry that didn't answer your question exactly about McCarthy, but. So when, when, when McCarthy was, I guess he was ousted, I mean, how, how, did, it, how did it end? I, I think that the, that the Senate finally got tired of him and, and realized how dangerous he was and realized how See, the problem was he was saying, you know, he was the head of the House Un-American Activities, so the House, House Un-American Activities Committee, you know, and if you attack him, you're un-American. But after a while, people started seeing the damage he was doing by having the power to call anybody un-American. And, and I, I think that he just was pulled down by his own, uh, he, he went too far and he was pulled down by his own momentum. And, and people just got fed up with him. And they saw too many people victimized by what he did. And uh, so it's, I think it was a natural evolution, but it was certainly a painful one. And so those who were blacklisted, how did their careers then turn out once he was... Well, they, they were out of it until, you know, after he was no longer in power. And then they were sort of creeping back into the picture but they were never fully exonerated until after I think everybody was dead, you know, because that's how long it takes for bureaucracies to change. You know, whether the bureaucracy is the Academy of Motion Pictures or whether it's the US government, it's still a bureaucracy. And it takes it a while to make sure the coast's clear and make some changes. And uh, so I think we're, we're in very interesting times and creative people should be, you know, just sucking up all the all the, intro, all the facts from every direction to try to mold it into something that makes sense. I mean, one of the interesting things about the Trump era is that 
I can't imagine people writing um, a story about it, you know, about writing a satire about Washington anymore, because it is larger than life already. And that's because an entertainer took over, you know, an entertainer is running the picture, you know, running the, the show. And uh, he, he knows how to make himself bigger than life. All he has to do is say a new crazy thing the next day. You know, we have complete peace with North Korea. Uh, everything is settled. Everything is cool. And Iran is, you know, building nuclear weapons. And suddenly the fact what was happening yesterday with his being accused of this and that people, it's not on people's mind because the media is controlled by him saying this new thing and they drop the old thing. They don't drop it completely, but it goes down the shelf to where it's not as important. And because of that, it's very hard to write about him in any way that isn't. I mean, I find myself, much as I love The New Yorker, find getting bored writing, reading the anti-Trump stories because what else can you say? What else can you say? It's, it, it is a reality show that we're all kind of glued to, but um, it's entertainment. And then fortunately or unfortunately, it is changing the shape of American life. Uh, and where it goes is up to the people of the United States. Like, what are we going to do at the next election? And, you know, at this last election, people decided they wanted a change, but not as big a change as could have happened. Well, then you throw the Cambridge Analytica monkey wrench. And if, if we think that that is true, then how, easy, how easily led are we? If, if all that is true, if we were somehow blindsided by messages and people knowing our sort of emotional pulls and then trying to play to that. And how, what's the question? I'm not sure there's a question, it's just a statement. Yeah, yeah and I think it's, it's already happening because Facebook already knows all that stuff. Google already knows it all. I mean, Google knows when you've got a cold because you, you know, you, you Google what's the best cure for a cold today. And, and they know that you've got a cold. In fact, there's a study that shown that they can predict how many people in a city like Chicago have a cold right now simply by what people Google. And they keep track of it. They keep track of it all, mostly with our permission. Well, there's voice activated ads as well. Yeah. So you could be talking about kitty litter and then the next thing you know, you're bombarded with ads for, for you know, cat products. Yeah, and it's now, it's global, which is interesting. I mean, I, we just got back from J Japan and Thailand and suddenly I'm getting ads from Thailand and Japan and, and I don't know why, I guess, I guess I went on the internet in those countries, right? So now I'm, you know, they're bombarding me with uh, spam. And although that's very annoying, it's also very interesting and exciting to think that we are really becoming that global that, uh, and that wired into one big global brain. You know, there, years ago, a, a Jesuit philosopher named Teilhard de Chardin wrote a book called The Omega Point. And in it, he predicted that the human race was heading for the omega point. And that point, he said, was uh, a point when we are omnipresent, we are omniscient, and therefore we are omnipowerful, all powerful, which are the three characteristics that Thomas Aquinas defined as the characteristics of God. And omniscience means we know everything that's going on. Well, we're not quite there yet, but we're pretty dang close, right? Because people are sending us videos from South Sea Islands and from Sakhalin, north of Russia, and from the South Pole and the North Pole. And we're omnipresent because we can be in the streets of Iran during a revolution. You know, we can be in the Tiananmen Square, et cetera. And, and power comes directly from that. Look at this girl who escaped Saudi Arabia and went to a hotel room when she was about to be taken into custody by the country she was in and just tweeted until the country was forced to, to take her to a safe place and to avoid returning her to Saudi Arabia. This, was, this is power. And she had this power in her hand and she knew how to use this power. And, and this will become more and more frequent. I mean, it is already everywhere, but 
next generation will have it down to a complete science of how to use this power to change the world. And, uh, you know, Teilhard de Chardin was excommunicated by the Catholic Church because of this book, because he was basically saying that we were evolving toward godhood. That, after all, why wouldn't we be doing that since it says in Genesis that God created us in his image and likeness? So if that's true, why wouldn't we be evolving toward being like him or her, right? Why not? And uh, the church excommunicated him because that was not a good thing to say as far as they were concerned. But of course, he's now massively respected even in the Vatican for his predictions. He wrote all of this in 1910 before, before radio had taken off, but television was you know, just a, uh, an ion in the mind of somebody and uh, social networking and all of that was not yet conceived but he predicted it all he predicted that all people would be in simultaneous communication with all other people and that the world would be would form a single consciousness and uh, the interesting thing about how creativity fits into a global consciousness is that if creativity is not nurtured uh, that global consciousness will have no form other than what, what the media give it. And the media are completely untrustworthy for a single reason. Their attention span is microscopic. It changes on a whim. Somebody important dies, and suddenly we're no longer worried about this case going through the Supreme Court. For three days, you know, we cover McCain's funeral. And uh, that's a little strange when you think about it, when you think about reality, like what's more important, this particular bill that be, means something for millions of people or watching every moment of a senator's funeral or a president's funeral, well, that is a me media decision is not based on any deep human reality. It's based on sponsorship. It's based on what they can get people to pay them money to run, and that's what they do. So if it wasn't for the creative people, we wouldn't have you know, a source that wasn't based on nothing but immediate uh, you know, feedback of, of what we need to keep this channel open, to keep CBS going. We have to do this programming and not this programming. Whereas the creative person is like, what? It's got nothing to do with me. You know, this person is involved in making statues out of paper and, you know, probably doesn't even know what's going on in the world half the time. So creativity is more important than ever was because it's the different part of us. It's the part that maybe foresees the future and gives us a better future to go to, toward or a worse one because it does, <coughs> it does us a huge service when it gives us a dystopian view of the future because maybe that will warn us from not going in that direction. I remember reviewing some of uh, science fiction books years ago for the LA Times, and some of them were predicting the, 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 we, you know, the weather changes that we're going through now and what could happen to the world. And uh, I like to think that a lot of the legislation that's occurred over the last 30 years was planted by some of these creative visionaries saying this could happen. Uh, and you know why people can say it's not happening is simply because they don't, a lot of people don't understand the importance of truth. And that's, that's what I think we're drifting into is a world where truth, imagine if the media were in charge of truth because everybody has an opposite view of it. I mean, one of the things that's most annoying in today's world is watching a panel of people arguing on television because they're not listening to each other and they're all making interesting points but there is no dialogue. You know, there's no exchange, there's no move forward from this conversation, which is what dialogue used to mean. Two things coming together for the purpose of moving forward. And we're not living in that world right now, except in the creative path when a novel is written or a great painting is unveiled or a statue is unveiled that makes us look at everything differently.